Hello and welcome to another episode of The Brett Campbell Show. I'm your host, Brett Campbell. That's right, the one and only. Uh, Today, I'm speaking with Nathaniel Bibby. Nathaniel Bibby uh, is ranked as the number one in Asia-Pacific region, 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 on the Social Media Marketing Institute's top LinkedIn marketers list. He also won the best use of LinkedIn in 2019 at the Social Media Marketing Awards as well. Um... The reason why I wanted to get Nathaniel onto the show today was everywhere I'm looking on socials, he is referred to as the LinkedIn guy, the the guru of LinkedIn. And I wanted to know a few things about LinkedIn. I wanted to have a chat and I know you guys will get some value out of us sharing what can you do on LinkedIn to generate more leads? How can you be more authentic? How can you use messaging properly and effectively to actually make sales, right? Nathaniel's generated over $400 million in sales through LinkedIn and lead generation for himself and his clients um, over the years. He was a very early adopter. When I adopted Facebook back in 2007, eight, he adopted LinkedIn. So he knows a thing or two about it. We actually break down how you can actually reach out to customers, the process around that. You can literally At the end of this episode, go and implement the strategies that we're talking about and you'll be able to generate some clients, I guarantee it. So we talk about all things LinkedIn. Uh, We talk about content creation on platforms, what we should be doing. I also share a few horrific um, stories of mine in the early days of business. Um, One that actually um, I went and sat in the car and just absolutely lost it. I was crying. Um, So stay tuned for that one. you might get a little bit of a laugh out of it, but it was not funny at the time, I assure you of that. Um, but uh, then we also take a little bit of a turn at the end. As always, what you'd expect from this show is we talk about a number of different things um, that uh, that I like talking about. So I think you'll get some value out of that too. But at the very least, the first 90% of this episode is all on LinkedIn. How do you build and grow your business using LinkedIn? So Please, if you are getting value from these episodes, head over to iTunes, drop us a five-star review. I'd really appreciate that. Um, And also take a screenshot of you listening to the show, upload it to your Instagram stories, tag me at Brett Campbell Official. That way I know you're listening. So without further ado, let's jump into today's episode with Nathaniel Bibby. Nathaniel Bibby, welcome to the Brett Campbell Show, mate. I'm excited to have you here. Mate, I'm pumped to be here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm sensing an accent. Am I correct? Um, I'm, yeah, I'm English originally. Um, English. So I, I ended up in Australia when I was 10 years old. Yeah. Right. And you've still got the English accent. Mm, well, it, some people say so. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I mean, I, I just sort of picked it up maybe because I was, I was actually going through some one of my old YouTube channels yesterday. Um, oh, yeah. I, last At the start of the week, I, I ran a presentation on content development and... I was going back and I didn't realize how many YouTube channels I actually had. And I went back, back, you know, 12 years ago when I first started my ever, my first ever YouTube channel and I was going through the videos and I'm originally from New Zealand and New Zealand has, you know, we've got quite a strong accent as well. And I didn't realize we had an accent until I came to Australia. Um, and yesterday I was watching some of the videos and my accent was really strong. So I'm, my mind must still be on accent. So that's how I was able to pick yours up. <laughs> yeah, Mate, yeah. So 10... Ten years old, you moved to uh, moved to Australia. Where'd you move to? Well, we moved to Hong Kong when I was five. Right, and so when I, you know, when I was ten, we um, the parents decided I would go to boarding school, and rather than go back to England, I decided to go to Perth, which is a lot closer and mm. a lot a lot better weather. You know, the, the school I had a look at uh, had eighteen AFL football pitches in a row, and in Hong Kong we had one concrete soccer pitch. So, <laughs> wow. It was amazing. So, uh, grew up in Perth. Um, what we were, were you a good student? Did you get kicked out of high school? What what what, did, what was that like for you? Yeah, like I guess when that when I started boarding school is when it, the trouble all started. Mm. <laughs> you know, and I hear it a lot from entrepreneurs. It's interesting when I was asked to go back to my high school to to talk about entrepreneurship. You know, one of the things I said straight away was, "Well, you know what." what grades you get in school is not really going to determine what how you do as an entrepreneur. Most of the successful entrepreneurs I kn- know we are suspended, expelled, mm. <laughs> in, de- in detention. And, you know, the teachers are all looking at me all cross-eyed. And then there was four other speakers after me and they all sort of backed me up. <laughs> you know, well, it's true though, isn't it? Because it's, it's interesting because I've thought about that. I'd, I'd like to go back to my high school and um, 
you know, be able to speak to all the students. But yeah, I got kicked out of high school, so I mean, my my exit strategy probably wasn't the greatest <laughs> one as well. But um, there you, you go. Yeah. What you said there was, it was it's interesting for an entrepreneur. What do you mean by that? So a, as you were going through high school, you had desires for something different. What you didn't like the schooling system. You didn't get on with it. What was the there was a couple of things going on. I think I did. I found it. I, I learned in a different way. I, I could cram like a night before an exam, pick it all up, do the right. exam, yep. pass, then forget it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, <laughs> you know, I was I was looking for attention, and you know, my parents were all the way in Hong Kong, mm. and so the easiest way to get it is to get in trouble, right? Mm. Very true. <laughs> You know, first it was them, then it was girls. So <laughs> it doesn't uh, lend itself well to being a good student. So a- after high school, what what did you end up doing? What was what was some of the first things that you got your teeth stuck into? Um, so, so I did go to um, university. I studied marketing. Um, again, you know, that was a lot of you know fun and and so on. What um, did you just, learn at university with marketing lo- that you really use today still? Uh, well, I didn't learn anything about marketing that I use today. Right. But I did learn how to learn. So if right. it's, it's like one of those things, like if you don't understand about TikTok, yeah. you know, I've got that growth mindset to go and find out. Yeah. Um, I, that's the biggest thing I've got from university. Um, but I did, I mean, I started a few companies. I mean, the first company I started, I was 14 years old. Um, the neighbor was throwing out a lawnmower. Um, so I asked him if I could have it. Then started knocking on doors, asking if I could mow lawns. Before I know it, four of my mates were working for me. <laughs> Mate, I, I swear there's only like half a dozen entrepreneurial stories. Like, yeah. I, I did that at 11. I literally door knocked the entire street. I luckily had a lawnmower. It was my it was my father's lawnmower, or my stepdad's lawnmower. Um, but, and and again, had, had friends mowing lawns for me as well. But the, the funny thing is, one of the biggest lessons I ever learned um, early on at that stage, because I was mowing lawns for free, right? Oh, not for free, but I was getting the mower and petrol and everything. And you know, my stepfather goes, oh, how, how are you paying for the petrol? And I'm like, oh, well, I'm using our petrol. He goes, oh, that costs money. I'm like, oh, what? What do you mean? <laughs> so he was already teaching me lessons there. But, um, mate, so you, you always had this this hunger then clearly to – do you think it's to create something or or was it to actually make money back then what was it for you what was a driver for you because for me it was to make money i wanted to i yeah. come from a very low socioeconomic area didn't didn't have no silver spoon no nothing you know you're at boarding school i was at, at a public school that weren't even paying our school fees right um however i had a hunger and desire for for money that's yeah. what drove me to door knock what what was it for you uh, yeah, I guess I, 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 that was nice. Um, but I mean, my dad was an entrepreneur, so I always right. sort of just sat there quietly and watched him a little bit like my puppy does now. <laughs> um, didn't understand it all, wanted to be like him, but then it kind of transitioned, you know, as I graduated high school and he was going through some issues with like property developments and stuff and no sales, it, it, it turned from, wanting to be like him to wanting to fix all of his problems, mm. you know, and, and also like it's the reason the business was the reason that we, the family wasn't close together. So I felt like, you know, um, and certainly today, even to this day, and it's, I'm great, very grateful for this from my childhood. Um, I, I, you know, help people with their digital marketing because it keeps families closer together. Ultimately, like if a, if a business goes bankrupt, it, it destroys the family. Well, in my, you know, in my case, it did. My parents got divorced. You know, my dad went bankrupt. It, you know, it was very traumatic. Mm. When, when did you get into, because you, you're known in the, in the, let's call it the industry space, um, LinkedIn's your thing, right? That's that's one of the main reasons that I wanted to, to jump on and have a bit of a chat with you. Um, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm all for, for talking with people who are doing similar things or, you know, crossing crossover um, skill sets. You know, I, I spoke with um, had another agency owner on here. You, you probably know Kim Kim Barrett from Perth as well. Um, yeah, no, Kim. Well, where yeah. a lot of people are like, oh, why do you speak to competition? And you know, they're direct competitors. <laughs> it's like, well, look, you you'll know something that we probably don't, and and vice versa. And I think there's you know there's um, there's a lot to be gained from people who are doing something. Um, of similar nature than you. So I wanted to get yeah. on here and pick your brain firstly about LinkedIn and, and whatever else yeah. we can uncover. But um, to give me the evolution of LinkedIn, where did it start for you? Because I cut my teeth in the Facebook era of 2008 when it sort of started to happen. When did you get into the um, the, the LinkedIn as your major um, 
you know, service well, offering or so? I, it was around 2008, probably seven, maybe, that I decided to move to Melbourne and I um, was heading up the sales team for a friend of mine's company who had a web marketing agency. So selling everything, SEO, you know, yeah. Facebook, all, all, the, all the online marketing stuff, web dev. Um, and, you know, like I was, I, I just said to him, what's the best target market for web marketing? I'd worked in real estate before. So he said, um, plastic surgeons are the best. They got loads of money. They always need new clients. And so, you know, I was just being naive to the industry, I guess. Like I went door knocking, that didn't really work. I tried cold calling. I couldn't get past the practice manager. And like, it was just happened to be the time when I set up this LinkedIn profile. So mm. I used it to find these surgeons. I contacted 10, I got six responses. Four people had meetings with me. I made one sale. But mm. when I go to a sales meeting, again, being naive, like everyone's like, oh yeah, I made 15 sales and that equates to 15 grand in revenue. And I was like, well, I only made one sale, but it was $25,000, mm. you know? So it's like an A grade client. So I was like, okay. So ne the next week, you know, I contact twice as many surgeons. And so we- And that was that via, that via LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. That was really yeah. early days, 2008 LinkedIn. Well, that's the thing. Like most of them were right. saying, oh, geez, a LinkedIn message. Haven't had one of these before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Very true. It's you like know? when you and first- so I, got, I, was, I was a member of this networking, B&I networking group, you know, 25 people that, you know, give each other referrals. Yep. And I stood, stood up one day and I said, oh, I've got to, I've got to quit. And they said, why are you quitting? And I said, oh, look, I'm just getting too much leads through LinkedIn. This, this is not best use of my time. Mm. And then half of the group come up to me afterwards and they say, um, if we give you some money, will you teach us how to get leads on LinkedIn? Mm. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, this is interesting. And so then um, I started doing these courses. The Australian Digital Marketing Institute commissioned me to create their first, the first LinkedIn course in Australia. Um, that company I was working for went into financial issues and I found myself like not being paid for three months, getting evicted, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I was kind of at, at that point where, you know, it was either start a company now or, um, mm. you know, fall flat my face. So that's what I did. I started um, Australia's first LinkedIn marketing agency. And it was interesting because everyone said to me, is LinkedIn going to be enough? You know, and what's interesting though, is like, if you're a spe specialist, you know, it doesn't take long for you to be the top of Google for LinkedIn marketing. And so if somebody's putting a conference together or, you know, mm. and it, if LinkedIn comes up in conversation, I get the call. So it, you know, worked really well. Got some really mm. good clients on board. So what are people doing wrong with LinkedIn? Let's start there. What are people doing wrong? Well, I mean, it was created as a Rolodex of resumes and recruiters would use it to find talent. And so that LinkedIn never anticipated there'd be all these salespeople and marketers on the platform in the first place. And so a lot of business owners and salespeople who were using it to get clients have a version of their resume uploaded to their profile. Mm. And I, I always say to them, I don't know about you, but have you ever bought anything by looking at somebody's resume? You know, so it has to be in customer centric language, talk about the problems and the value proposition. Um, so that, that's the biggest thing that people do wrong. And then all, the other thing is like, people are so selfish and, and we, uh, I mean, I'm like this as well. It's naturally we're selfish, we're impatient. And so if they're using it to generate leads, they'll contact people and just start selling, you know? Yeah, and then that's that. when people say, well, LinkedIn's full of spam. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so that doesn't work. And even if you're not a salesperson, even if you're on LinkedIn as you're trying to grow your career, most people, when they log on, they just, um, oh, I'm going to spend 15 minutes on LinkedIn. I'll log in. Oh, look, I've got 15 connection requests. I'll accept, I won't accept that guy, but I'll, you know, accept some of them. Mm. But they're being reactive. And then they wonder why they get all these sales letters and all these recruitment letters because they haven't controlled who's in their network. They've just been reactive. They've accepted these people that generally yeah. have, are connected with them because they want to sell them something. So let, let, let me um, tap on that for a so, second. I've got a question yeah. to ask with that because because I, I yeah. get a lot of people asking this as well. Do you think you should select everyone who accepts, who, who tries to connect with you, or should you diligently sit down and go through and look for reasons to create the connection? What, what did you do? Yeah, the, I mean, the latter. I, it comes down to your objectives, right? Like if right. you want to win a popularity contest, accept everyone. Yep. Um, if you're using it to, to grow your business, the question I always ask myself is, is this person likely to be connected to somebody that I could do business with? Because if they are, then all it's doing is expanding your second degree network, which mm. is a positive thing. Yep. Uh, but um, yeah, look, if they're not relevant, you know, I don't, I don't deal with people on the other side of the, the, side of the world in some countries. So um, if I get like, 
you know, digital agencies contacted me from there. Generally, I just, I don't accept because I don't, I, I can't handle my inbox being full of sales letters. It's too difficult to manage the people that actually want to do business. Because mm, then what you do is you start being just too ruthless with the delete button because you're like, ah, just delete, delete, delete. You got 50 requests for the day and you're like, a lot, half of them have sent you an email message and it's just almost, you get that message overwhelm, right? So, yeah. and you see it a lot and you, you just hit the nail on the head and this is just one, um, I guess, one side of, of LinkedIn and, and any any bloody um, platform, to be perfectly honest, if someone connects with you is someone will connect with you and as soon as you accept them, you know, a message comes on through and it, it gives you their entire, here's what we do, here's how long we've been doing it, do you want help? It's like, oh my gosh, like that's the first thing you could do to to polarize someone away from you, right? So how does someone go about using LinkedIn to grow their business? Where do we start? Well, what do we do? Well, there's there's that side of it, um, the messaging side of it, and I'll explain how to approach people the right way. But there's also, at the moment, the content side of it is a huge opportunity. Mm. And one of the things that you've got to think about when you are connecting with people is when you do invite them into your network is they they actually will be in your audience. And so on the basis that your content isn't terrible, they'll, they'll see your content. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like Instagram or YouTube where people subscribe or follow. You can actually invite people into your audience. Mm. But you don't, you don't want to just grow this massive audience. There's no point having 50,000 people that are just all, like most of them are irrelevant. If they're targeted, you've got much higher chance of actually generating engagement because the content's going to be more relevant. But going back to your question, the, the message is, that um, that work is when you don't assume that people need what you offer, right? Mm. Like if I service digital agencies, I might think, you know, you're the perfect target market. I could grow your business really fast. But if I tell you that before I know anything about you or even speak to you, then I'm going to come across as a salesperson. And to be honest, I don't want to, I don't want to sell to somebody who hasn't got the problem that I solve. Mm. So if I approach you, I'd say, hey, I've had a look at your profile. I can see that you're in this industry, very similar to some of the companies I work with. I'd like to have a conversation to find out more about what you're doing to see if there's an opportunity for us to work together. I haven't said anything about what I do. If you're if you're intrigued, you'll click on my name and read my profile. So you know, mm -hmm. obviously, if it's a resume, that's gonna it's gonna fall apart there. Yep. But um, but so you don't assume a need. You don't assume that people are interested in what you say. You can only tell them what they already know or what they already know they want to know. If when, they haven't when, established a need. When I hear that, and I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second, it's like, hey, I've looked at your profile. Whenever I read that, like, hey, I've looked at your profile, I'm like, oh, have you really, though? This 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 seems like maybe a copy and paste message that you've sent on through to me here. you know. Yeah. And maybe it's because I'm skeptical because I get so bloody many, but it's... um. What what other is is that the that's the the gold standard that you that you utilize? Again, I'm always open to well, to being challenged with with data and and um, success, yeah. of course. Because well, I, that's that's the thing is is it's data. Like the numbers, yeah. the numbers are the things that I look at. Numbers don't lie. And and you know, to your point, like a lot of people do reply saying stuff like that. And you know, I just. I manage it and say, no, no, you know, I do work in this industry. Yeah. I, th I think you could be a good candidate, but I don't know. Yeah. We'd have to have a conversation to find out. Some people just don't want to have a chat. Most of them don't respond, obviously. Like so there's yeah. about 30% conversion rate, which, you know, in cold it's calling it's 1%. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, depends so on what industry you're saying for every 100 messages you send. So you'll send, give me the, what, what would Nathaniel do? You'd send, well, you'd pick an I mean, audience, I did, I, pick a target. Yeah, Break I focus on content these days. I mean, okay. back in the day, I used to generate leads this way. Um, when I had a I had a sales team, and I used to fill up their calendar doing this. Yep. But like for a client, like this is the averages. So you send out if you send out four hundred connection requests yep. on average, you'd get two hundred new connections. Yep. And if you send them all the message, out of two hundred, you'd get thirty leads. So it's fifteen percent on mm -hmm. average across all the industries I've worked in. Um, which you know, is more than enough to yeah, absolutely. Do business. Yeah. So how would you find the 400 connections? You'd go to LinkedIn and you'd type in like CEO or you'd type in fitness. Like wh what would you do? How, how do you, how do you well, find, cause that's what you say. The value is in yeah. the making sure you're creating the best connections. Correct. Yeah. So like you've got your existing network, which is your first degree. This, the gold is in your second degree. You've pretty much got visibility over your client's potential referral network if you're connected with them. Mm. So you, you next to the search bar, there's a tab that says advanced. And if you click on that, it allows you to be a lot more granular with your search phrases. So you can say, okay, I just want second degree connections. 
their job title must say CEO. They must be in the facility service industry. Mm. They must be in Sydney. And so all of those criteria will meet. And, you know, the second degree network might, maybe if you don't have many connections, it's only 100 people. But what will happen is as you connect with those 100 people, next time you do a search, it'll be 2,000 people because mm. you, you bring in more people into your network. So it's, it's an unlimited source of, of opportunities, I think. When would you use the in-mail? So, you know, you pay whatever it is, 60, 70 bucks a month, which is crazy, I reckon. But um, I mean, if you've got cure for cancer, do it. But I mean, unless you've got a really compelling offer, emails, the conversion rate is very similar to email marketing. It's like 2 to 3%. And yeah. as I said, the, when you actually connect with people first and they've almost like when they accept, it's almost like they give you implied consent that you can contact them down the future and obviously the conversion rates five times as high so this goes back to why linkedin was created i saw their second business plan which they use for capital raising and there's no mention of sales people or marketers so sales navigator product is just created you know halfway through the journey mm, okay so let's say we've created some connections we've um done the you know the, the reach out you're saying 30 percent, so 15 percent is is gonna engage what what do you generally do there how, how do how do you start this relationship off well like you know there's there's a lot of factors outside of just this whole sequence like it's yep. gonna like it, it may not be 15 percent, it may be a lot higher maybe a lot sure. lower depends on the brand um so so what was the question sorry how do you so what 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 happens next so let's say i've reached out bob has re- you know i've sent yep. to bob hey bob checked out your profile looks like we got some uh similarities yep. here Let's catch up for a coffee. I want to find out more about it. Well, I, I th- from my experience... Do you try and like take a, it off the platform as fast as you can? Do you keep absolutely. it on the platform? I mean, if if you if you know that they're going to be an ideal client, coffee is great. But normally, like I would take them to a phone call. So because you want to, maybe you want to qualify them a bit more. Yep. And the main thing you want to qualify is just the timing. So like if somebody's contacting you through your website, they've searched for what you do, they're looking for a solution, you know that they have commercial intent. Mm. Whereas on LinkedIn, they might be the A grade client, but you just don't know whether or not now is the right time. So a phone call is generally the best next move. A lot of um, LinkedIn marketers in the States and stuff, the guys that I, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, see as, um, you know, started around the same time as me, because there wasn't anyone in Australia doing it at the time. Um, they will do message sequences like drip campaigns um and then you know when i dig a little deeper and i ask them what their conversion rates are you know it's it's the same as what i'm achieving and they're sending three or four messages but what i think the difference is is when they send those multiple messages is they're kind of isolating all the other people because i find that you know if i send somebody one message if they don't respond but they're in my network they see my content and so they may actually come back to me a lot of, a lot of, it's interesting how many business owners come back to me five years later mm. and say, I've been watching your stuff for five years. You know, I may not have seen a like or comment from them. Um, but yeah, hop on a phone call and then you qualify them a bit more. It's really important that you've got a script, right? Like, you know, no matter how good a salesperson you are, you know, you say when they get on the phone and say, okay, um, thanks for making the time today. The purpose of this call is for me just to ask a few questions, see if we're a good fit to do business together or not. Is it okay if I ask you a few questions? And then they say yes. And then you should guide them through the process. You don't want to hop on a call and they're like, uh, yeah, what, what's all this about? And mm. it's like, well, um, uh, hi, I sell you know, this. You know, that's not yeah. the way to do it. Yeah, um, be very methodical with your time. And, and you're right there. It's, it's not about just attracting the person and connecting with them. It's about what are you going to do with that and truly identifying you know, whether or not you can do something together. I see so many yeah. times when people get on the phone call, it's like, Oh, tell me what you do. I'll tell you what I do. And it's like, let's just let's just ask a couple of clarifying questions and see if we're <laughs> even in the market for X, Y, Z right now. I love know? that. Yeah. So, um, so what what else can you tell us from a um, a messaging? So, if we're staying on the messaging aspect at the moment, what what other secrets can you unravel right now? What else are um, people not doing or could be doing better? Yeah, uh, I mean, the one I think it's. Be, be personalized like that makes a big difference mm. you know um and if you if you want to go after like these awesome clients right this is a strategy that everyone should really be doing like i i was thinking about some of the businesses i was working with and i was like i really want to work with these international companies and the one thing about international companies is they all have chief marketing officers right cmos so i was like okay i'm going to start a podcast called the cmo podcast i make the media kit look really fancy and then, you know, I contact the CMO of Samsung or the CMO of like, 
um, Spotify. And if I said, "Hey, I've looked at your profile," I'd like to, you know, mm. they're not going to speak to me, right? No. <laughs> that's not going to work with those guys. But if I say, "Hey, I, I've look, uh, looked at your profile, and I think you'd be a perfect fit for the CMO podcast," I'd love to interview you. They actually don't get asked that often. These, no. these executives, um, and it's I haven't had one episode where we haven't finished the podcast, obviously it gives them a good experience. It's very well organized. Mm-hmm. Um, so it gives them a good taste of doing business with me. But I haven't had one guest that hasn't said to me after the podcast, so Nathaniel, what do you do? tell me what you do. <laughs> yeah. Could you help our team? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so great lead generation tool. You got to, but it's the mindset of adding value, right? Yeah. Like when you're reaching out to somebody, if you got to think about adding value to them, um, mm-hmm. especially if they're really busy, you know, yeah. like, um, so yeah, anyway. anyone listening anyone listening to this and you want to connect with Nathaniel, here's what I'd do. I'd say, hey, I listened to your episode on, on Brett Campbell on the Brett Campbell show. Right. So it's yeah. it's not of it's a lot of people do that. It's taking the whole of because what what I do, because I, I like to sort of play the game a little bit, when someone goes, Oh, I listened to your podcast on the I listened to your episode on the XYZ podcast. I'll go, oh, cool, what was your favorite takeaway? Like, I'll always go back to go, oh, what, what did you like most about it? And you can quickly tell if they've listened to it or not, right, or if they've just done a scan. Um, yeah. But I highly recommend that if you are, and, and what we're sort of talking about here is more the intentional reach out, right? I think yeah. the, the day of just sitting in your office and sending out 800 connections to try and get one of them to put their hand up is you'd rather be much more intentional, put the time, effort, energy, and to your point, you know, you got one sale for 25,000 versus 15 mm. sales, you know, mm. um, at a thousand bucks a pop like your, the old um, mm. sales team did because you spent the time up front to, to do the work, right? Um, so be yeah. very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Very bespoke in your, because there's individualized customer journeys, right? And I mean, that's what we we approach from what we do here at Klax and, and, and I'm sure you guys would too when you create campaigns for any businesses. You're not just talking to one bulk person here. Everyone has their own individualized journey throughout the entire process because they enter into the the sequence at any particular stage, right? Mm-hmm. And at any one time, there could be, multiple different conversations happening um so reach out to nathaniel if you're reaching out to him and say you've listened to the brett campbell show and i liked how you said xyz or i liked where you shared that story because mm. we're human right i don't know about you but when i hear when people reach out to me like that and they've actually put some intent behind it and and gone to the effort i'm like well that at least deserves a reply mm. right and that's what it's all about it's about getting the reply first and then you've got to be even smarter with okay if you get a reply from Nathaniel, what's your plan B? Like, what's your next? Because he could just say, oh, thanks, that's great, appreciate it. And then what, you end it there? <laughs> right, you've got to know what your second base, third base, and home run is, yeah. right? Yeah, it's a mindset for sure. Um, but, I mean, the other thing is, like, the people don't realise, and I, I realise this more when I work with clients, is, like, I had a, a consulting firm come to me. The guy's not even on LinkedIn yet. He said, I saw one of your talks, loved it, I want to, I'm, I'm all in. I want to, I'll do everything. What, what do you recommend? And I so, said, so we're growing his network with CEOs of mining companies. We're sending them follow-up messages to set appointments. We did a video interview, chopped it up into like 50 videos. We're posting videos. So as these people join his network, they're seeing his videos. He's inviting them to a phone call. Some of them are saying yes. The other people are seeing the videos. And then the other thing I noticed is when I log into his account to, to have a look how it's all going, and I go to the news feed, who do you think is in the newsfeed? It's just all CEOs and mining companies and all their posts. Mm. And most of them, they're not they're only getting two or three likes. So I said, hey, you know, if you hop in here for 15 minutes a day yeah. and comment on this guy's stuff, you're going to build, yeah. it'll release dopamine. Um, you're going to build a relationship with them. And so I think social media creates conversations. Conversations create relationships and relationships sh- should, um, should you know, translate to, to business. So yeah. Yeah, I talk about this just, often the... You know how I've been able to create some of my, I guess you would say, um, I mean, all relationships are, are equal in, in essence because we're all human beings, but how you would maybe build a relationship with someone that you may not have thought that you were able to build a relationship with where you're like, oh, they're just too hard to get to or, you know, how how'd you <laughs> end up doing this, right? So um, yeah. it's the intent that you put behind wanting to build the relationship because what we all need to understand yeah. though, whether you're using LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, um, or any platform is we are all humans, 
right? Even Hollywood stars, you know, still a human and they will read some of their comments. But to your point, if you've got old mate, the mining um, magnate who's got two likes and you're the only person consistently commenting on their posts with a good, not just a fire emoji, you know, with an actual good piece of commentary back, you will be that person who's in front of mine, right? Your little profile picture has so much real estate in it. People people totally um, yeah. neglect their profile picture. And here's another little, I'll throw a, a tip out, is I'm a big believer in making sure your profile picture is succinct over all platforms because if you're in face, if you're in LinkedIn and you know, he sees that grey photo with blah, blah, blah and you're wearing a blue shirt and then all of a sudden in Facebook they see a nice little profile picture, oh, that's the same, oh, it's Brett, you know? Um, the continuity is, is really valuable. Great advice. You know? Great advice. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important. Yeah. Like to your point, it's important to um, connect with them on multiple channels because, you know, the world's changing so quick. We, yep. you know, LinkedIn may be gone next year. Mm. Who knows? <laughs> that, that, that's a good piece of advice is once you connect with them on one and you've, you've made an impact or you've created a connection where they might have just liked your comment even or they've replied back to your comment. Then go and find them on all the channels. Go and find them on Instagram. Go and find them on Facebook. Add them as a friend. Because, again, it's it, you're right. Think about how many people that you actually follow on LinkedIn that you probably don't on Instagram and vice versa, yeah. right? I, tr I mean, I try to. Like, it's like you, on LinkedIn, you might have, like, the – yeah, the CMO of, of, you know, Spotify, you find them on Instagram and it's, you know, it's a picture with their, with their kids or their dog yeah. and it's very personal. So if you yep. do connect with them there, you have a very different relationship. Yep. Than yeah, and he's got 86 followers on Instagram, but he's got, you know, 25,000 connections on LinkedIn. It's a different, it's a different yeah. landscape, you That's know, because right, yeah. we, we all as humans seek attention. Right, some of us more than others, and some of us <laughs> will let it be known more than others. Right, but at the end of it, the hum a human desire is of connection, and if you can yeah. have a valuable connection and not a spammy connection, which is what we talked about at the, the start, is just block pasting a fucking message that is not going to do anything but piss the person off. You know, yeah. if you go and then try and follow them on or connect with them on any other platform, they're like, ah, oh, fuck that. Right, you'll kill yeah. the relationship before it even starts. That's right. Yeah, mate. Content. So, obviously, yeah. we just shared a, a fair bit there around messaging. You know, and whether it's LinkedIn or any platform, you can take that that those parameters and, and utilize it. Um, LinkedIn's had a bit of a transformation over the last, let's call it, eighteen months. Right, eighteen months, two years. I mean, they've totally just copied Facebook from a layout and everything. About time, because why would you not? Success breeds. <laughs> um, success leaves clues, right? And um, yeah. that's basically what they've done. But you, you were an early adopter, so you would have seen the evolution of LinkedIn. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I created my LinkedIn profile about probably 2010, 2009, but I didn't do anything until maybe a handful of years ago, you know, three, four years ago, because I was like, mm. oh, this platform's just crap. But now yeah. it's sort of it's evolved into a social platform. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it was – probably three four years ago that they introduced video uh, very late adopters you know yeah. they're just rolling out live video you know only a handful of people have got it in australia um so yeah it's following face it's kind of following facebook's evolution i think the one thing that they haven't done which facebook did um you know facebook killed the organic reach for a lot of mm. and i guess it's a different platform like you got business professionals individuals that are posting content um, but you can get a lot of organic reach. doesn't matter if you've got a big audience or not. Like if you've got, you know, good content and you get uh, some engagement early on. I mean, it's the algorithm's getting smarter. So a lot of content creators at the moment that were crushing it on LinkedIn are like, ah, the algorithm's dead and it's not working anymore. Mm. But the reality is like it, there's still as many organic posts in the newsfeed. It's just getting smarter and they're just not as good as they thought they were, you know? Mm. Um and, and people are spending three times as much time on the platform as they were 18 months ago. So you're yeah. exactly right. So that means that the se obviously session time is higher, which means there's, there's potential for more engagement. So your content is probably more likely to be seen. And it's just getting better. Like ever since Microsoft bought LinkedIn, they've just been rolling out product update after product update. You know, So it's just getting better and better all the time. There's always a limit to everything, right? Even LinkedIn hit the – it was around the billion – billion mark so when facebook hit their first billion you know i i noticed the the biggest critical drop off of organic reach because i sort of cut my teeth in the very early days um using organic methods so 
Yeah, we've got tens of millions of um, fans in our network. Our, I'll call it our social ecosystem over multiple different um, you know brands that we have, and um, there is about two thousand and twelve ish where we literally woke up and checked one of our fan pages. We'd we'd normally put posts up and get you know seventeen thousand likes on a post, right? Is this Instagram? This was Facebook. This was before Facebook, Instagram. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Right. And then all of a sudden, the posts were getting like 700, 800 likes. We're like, wow. Like, and we looked at the insights, and it was literally where you could almost assume Facebook pressed a button and it just went boom. Like, it, it was the first evolution of the destruction <laughs> of organic reach. And then the next one happened in around 2016, 17, about 17. And then now, Facebook, you can put things up and you, you pretty much get crickets in comparison. But the reason being is Facebook now have 2.6 billion users, right? More users, more time on. There's only 24 hours in a day, right? And consumption is is crazy right now with, with every user on average. But you're fighting for competition, right? So it's no longer just a matter of let's just do a Facebook Live or an Instagram yeah. Live or let's just put up a video. There has to be value behind the video. There has to be value behind yeah. what you're doing and someone to want to actually tune in and consume the next piece that you have. What what do you got for us around content? What are some of your um, key yeah. key things that you you need to look at? Well, I mean, the one thing with LinkedIn is you see the caption before the before the media, so it's the opposite to Instagram. So the caption will compel people to watch the video, right? So just because somebody viewed the caption doesn't mean they're going to press play. And if they do press play, the average is that after ten seconds, fifty percent of your audience is gone. After a minute, it's 80% of your audience. Mm. So if you spend the first 10 seconds going, hey, it's Nathaniel here. I just thought I'd hop on and do a video. Um, happy Friday. Hello, LinkedIn. Mm. You know, 50% of your audience <laughs> is gone. <Yeah. laughs> like, you've got to get straight to the, to the point um, and put the most value up front if you want people to watch it. But if you do it correctly, video is an incredible way to build relationships at scale and engage with an audience at scale. Mm. Um, it's it's incredible. But you can do pictures. They work just as well if you've got good captions. Um, articles still do really well. Uh, LinkedIn do like to see content creators do a mix of each so that they don't get people coming along, just hack one area and then they yeah. you know go viral. And um, yeah, they like to see a variety. Uh, try not to take people off the platform, like you know, putting links in in um, posts and stuff. Normally, you know, limits your reach and mm. stuff. Um, and, but the key is to get you know engagement early on. So I think th this applies to all social media channels, but and even to the messaging. Like it's you just got to remember, it's not about you. The one thing you can guarantee other people care about is themselves. Mm. And so you got to sort of focus on providing a value to them and not not look at the scoreboard in terms of number of followers or number of views, because as soon as you start doing that, you start diluting the content and make it cater for everyone, not specifically to someone. Mm. And and that that means you won't get any engagement. You know? yeah. um, and, and the other thing is like people, when they want to get successful at content, they're like watch Nathaniel's stuff and they go, oh yeah, he's doing really well. Let's do what he's doing. And they kind of try to copy people or whatever, you know, me or Grant Cardone or Kerwin Ray, whatever it may be. Um, but the, the secret behind actually being authentic is being more of yourself. So you've got to do the opposite to that. It's like yeah. you, you've got to stop looking at everyone else and think about what's unique about me, what's who's my audience. Mm. And ha I have a very clear picture. I know his name. I know how many kids he's got. I know where what magazines he reads. So when I'm writing my captions, it's like I'm writing a text message to him. I know, exa you know exactly who I'm speaking to. Yeah. Do, you, do you use your LinkedIn only and do you recommend you use your LinkedIn only for – business means <laughs> um, <clears throat> um I, look i mean it's really up to the individual i guess yeah. um i mean i, I, think, I think it think comes back I, to your br it's your brand right it's yeah. like if your brand is personable so for me yeah. for example the brett campbell brand is the easiest way i can reconcile everything is what you see is what you get, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna. There's, there's not many limitations that I have on my own personal brand, right? Because I, I want people to, to follow me and, and be connected with me and, and get value from me because of who I actually am as a human being, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. And there's, but for a lot of people, so for example, Gary Vaynerchuk, right? 
you don't even you've never seen his family you don't know where he lives you don't know anything about that right because that's a decision that he's made to go i'm just going to be known as this and and i think that comes back to whenever you're sitting down looking at this is all pre-content right um is your ability to create content to do with your brand so anything that we do klaxon wise comes out a specific way it looks a specific way it's it's in alignment with our brand and values and everything within the business um, yeah. the reason why i created the brett campbell show was so i i could be sitting here right now talking to you about linkedin but next minute we're talking about the australian government and how that's how that's bloody unfolding right because yeah. that's within my brand because my brand is here it is it's what you see is what you get right um yeah it's a it's a mixed bag and yeah. when you when you when you got to work within some constraints, you've got to work within those constraints. If that's the guidelines that you sort of set of who you are and what you are and what you want to be known about and known for. Yeah, well, and, and you got to think about does your audience care about yep. you know like so like I, do, does my audience care that I got a puppy? Probably, but do they care like you know where I take him to the vet or like what kind of lead I get him probably not mm. you know so I th always think about like is this going to add any value to my audience sometimes yep. they do want to see stuff that's going on in my personal life but not too much mm -hmm. they don't care that much <laughs> you know, they just... well that, that's an interesting point because I think it cares on levels right so if we look mm. at customers on levels there are people and who have been, who follow me on Instagram or Facebook or even on our email database where so I've gone through a number of um transformations um since covid right one physically mentally um, i'm i'm having a baby soon you know business is, is yeah it, like there's a lot of things happening right and interestingly enough and, and and i'll get to the point on what what i mean by levels right is that i've been talking about i've been on a carnivore diet for the last 10 weeks coming up 11 weeks where all i eat is meat right now that's that's piqued an interest. I've, I've put on at least a dozen people I know who have reached out to me and said, just based off that and you talking about it and sharing it and having an avenue to share it, right, um, has inspired them to want to go and do it, right? So you're right, though, but a prospect who's just come across Brett and they're, they're wanting to build their business, they don't give a fuck what type of ribeye fillet I'm having for dinner, right? <laughs> but there's some who absolutely love it, so it's that... It, I yeah. think where we sort of have to settle, and this is always the the, the question I get around, you know, how much personal brand do you do versus business branding? How do you separate yourself from them both? Do you separate yourself from them both? Um, it ultimately comes down to what you want, right? Like yeah. I, I care more about not caring that someone doesn't give a fuck about my ribeye steak than me not being able to share it with the people who actually care. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a decision I, that I have to make. It's a risk versus yeah. reward ratio, right? There's a, there's a lot of stuff I put, share on it. Like Instagram's more for me behind the scenes, more of my personal life. People yep. have a feel like my friends on there. Um, you know, a lot of people I know in person. Yep. LinkedIn, not so much so. However, they've rolled out, link, uh, LinkedIn have rolled out stories like Instagram in yep. Australia, UAE, and Brazil. That Only three countries so far. Yep. So if you try stories, you, you know, you're not going to get that much reach because it's not global yet yeah. but when it does i think you're going to see more of that behind the scenes stuff mm. and it's it does does actually build a much more powerful relationship with your audience when you show them that stuff you it's more like you become you go from being an educator to being like a celebrity <laughs> like, yeah. you know what i mean when they yeah. feel like they they're part of your life and they see but what's going on behind the scenes you know they really feel like they know you you know mm. so when you get approached like on the street at breakfast or something you know, they're, they're really excited, you know. And it that's a that's different. a differentiator that you just said there. It's it's platform, but also um, placement based, right? Stories mm. are engineered to be the behind the scenes type. Yep, that's where I'll I'll do a story of me cooking steaks on my barbie on the deck, looking out mm. over the ocean. That's the behind the scenes you get to see part of my life that I want to share, right? Yeah. Um, LinkedIn. I'm not necessarily in my feed. I'm not, you know talking about what I did in the weekend or putting up a random photo with me and a mate, you know, drinking a bottle yeah. of wine or unless, unless there's a purpose behind it. Right. But yeah. to your point is there's channels that allow you to share as much or as less as you want to be able to showcase. And I think yeah. ultimately it comes down to what are you comfortable with sharing? Right. And what, 
um, is going to be enough to be able to get your prospects to be able to move towards where you want them to be able to move towards, right? Is to do business with you, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And when you've been doing it for a while, like vulnerability comes naturally. But, mm. you know, I, I forget sometimes, I have to remind myself how difficult a lot of people do find it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the big things that people chat. Like, I, I can tell by talking to you, you're not too fussed what other people think on social media, you know? Yeah, I've, and, I've and got broad shoulders. Rare. I've got it's broad rare. shoulders. Yeah, it is rare, actually. And you're right. I, I have to also take a, a checkpoint every so often and go, when someone asks, oh, what do you do? Because I, was, I, was, I ran a workshop the other day for another um, business um, that I do a bit of work for. Um, I was running it to their students. It was all on content development. And someone asked, they said, what do you do if you're not confident enough to do it? It's easy to go, well, just fucking do it, right? You, you, that's how you get the battle scars and you got to learn it. But one thing that I did say that I think um, which came yeah, as a real benefit to me was I literally started a podcast and when I go back and listen and watch my first evolutions of what I did, I was like, oh my God, like I can, I laugh, like belly <laughs> laugh. Me and my, uh, for the presentation, I went back through and I was telling you earlier about videos that I'd done, right? One, my accent was crazy. The way I produced and announced things was just like cringeworthy. But yeah. but I was okay with that, and, and I think that comes back to being comfortable with who you are as a person, right? And yeah. and that's a, a much deeper conversation, um, but one that's that's very important and people need to, to be able to have because confidence comes from having a capability, right? When you've yeah, got a capability of something, mm. it increases your level of confidence. But to Absolutely. create capability, you need to have courage, Mm. right and you need courage to step in front of that camera and press play and go okay here we go but my advice is always don't do it behind a recorded camera go live that to your put vulnerable right if you can be yeah. vulnerable have the courage to go you know what all right because most people can actually speak like if yeah. you catch someone yeah. with their mate you hear you hear two people talking and you're like fuck that person talks pretty clearly they're pretty confident you can tell so we've all got it within us. We just have to have that courage to step in front of and go, okay, I'm yeah, going to be most okay. Do it better than me. I mean, like it's just, you know, the the hard thing for me was the first two years I was creating videos. Not many, no one was watching them. Not many people were watching them. Not yeah. many people. Like it was mainly on YouTube, and all my mates would see me. They go, "What are you? The hell are you doing those videos for? You got like yeah. three views, man. You're like, you know, you know, it's unprofessional, blah blah blah." And but the, I, when I look back at it, and I cringe as well, but um, I think to myself, no one was watching them anyway, mm. <laughs> you know. And all I was doing yeah, was true. getting better, you know. Yep. And then you get ten views, and then you get fifty views, and, you, and you're getting all this feedback. It's a game of volume. Yep. They own, there's no university course that's going to tell you to be an awesome content creator. You got to learn by practicing, and mm. po the more content you dump, the quicker you'll learn. Yep. Um, while everyone's trying to get their content perfect you could be getting like 20 bits of market feedback. So yeah. just posting it, dumping it is a way to learn. Yeah, my, my first um, introduction into creating content into the marketplace back in two, about 2009 when I did my first workshop, right? I, it wasn't a workshop. I ran a presentation. It was literally a 90-minute work um, presentation, a part of um, now really good friends of mine, um, their business, they were running a, a workshop for personal trainers. And... I was so hungry because I, I deep down really want to and I wanted to be a presenter. I was like, oh, I just I just love teaching and sharing to the masses. But I'd never done it, right? Mm. But, I, but I loved it. I loved the thought of it. And that in itself obviously gives me an unfair advantage to people who don't love it, right? Because that means I'm, I'm willing to put myself out there because I'm striving towards something mm. where most people are like, fuck, I've got to create this video. Oh, no. Um, where I wanted to do it. But I literally, I tape recorded their ninety, the ninety minute workshop that he that he actually ran because I was going to run that one next next okay. event. And I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to it, and I'm going through, and I must have listened to this whole workshop uh, ten times, like literally. Even to this day, right now, I could I could almost reverb probably fifty percent of it word for word, right? But yeah. here's the problem: it yeah. wasn't my words. It wasn't authentic, I stepped okay. up on stage and I delivered, like, I, I could put myself there right now and I could feel the sweat 
Yeah. Right? I put myself under so much pressure because I was saying someone else's words and I was trying to deliver their jokes and it just didn't come off. And then at the end of the day, I sat down with my friends and I'm like, have you got any feedback for me? And fuck, <laughs> it was terrible. They go, mate, that was absolutely terrible. Oh, I'm like, that's oh, good. Shit. <laughs> that's good, mate. So. I, yeah. Well, in, in a nice way, but it was, you know, look, yeah. uh, we think. That is good, yeah. You know, well, they firstly said, what do you think? <laughs> How do you think you went? And I'm like, you, you know well, <laughs> I was like, well, you know, that joke there didn't really work. You know, I'm just trying to pinpoint yeah. stuff. But then I went, literally sat in the car, had a big old cry. But then I realized, yeah. I'm like, okay. I still want to be able to speak and I know the leverage point of it because, you know, it's the ability to be able to speak to a crowd and generate business, you know, in the speaking um, arena is, is quite profitable, right? Mm. Um, and I still knew that I wanted to do it. So what I did was, and the, the lesson that I'm trying to get to here was my next presentation, I would have spent at least 20 hours in front of the mirror presenting to the mirror practicing 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 hey it's brett campbell oh hey it's brett campbell yo how you doing guys how are we yeah put your hand up if you do this you know um we should have had some behind the scenes footage of that stuff. yeah well if i had a video yeah that, that would have been that would have been quite funny actually it would have been a nice little documentary um but case in point is to the you know yeah. that we've all done it we've all done it yeah we, we've all had to sort of stumble our way through and you know i think Part of that now is what it's been able to do is, and if this has sort of come back full circle now, is I created videos that were super cringeworthy back in 2009, 10, 11, etc. That now I actually literally shared one on my Facebook profile this morning. And awesome. people are going off at it. It's funny and they're laughing. They're like, oh my God, because I had a big afro back then too. And <laughs> But what it does, it's an insight into me. It, it's like, oh, this guy just doesn't give a fuck what people think. He's putting himself out there like a lamb to sl slaughter. I'm like, say what, you, say what you want. But what it does is it creates that connection for other people to go, I wish... I could do well, that as well. you give them permission to try as well and yes. be crap, you know. Yeah. Because you, I mean, you look how far you've come. It's it's amazing. And, and when I'm creating content with clients, this is the challenge, right? Mm. They're like, oh, I've never been in front of a camera before. When they start talking about their business, they like, especially like consultants in the mining industry, it's all these long words and jargon. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, there's no emotion here. So like what, what I do is I, I've got the videographers there and and I connect right. I'm looking them dead in the eye, and and I just ask them question after question after question. What do you believe about this? You know, what's the most important thing in life? Like what? And so I'm asking these questions that I think will create engaging content. Mm. And then you know, from a half an hour interview, you could create like 30 micro pieces of content. Yeah. And they forgot the cameras even there, and yeah. the 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 um the footage is so authentic. Mm. But if they like I remember when I was starting out, like I tried to speak to the camera and I, get, I sounded like a fucking, like, <laughs> hey, I'm the yeah, like I just yeah. sounded ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, but what I ended up doing is I got the videographer who was hiring off Airtasker for like a hundred bucks an hour. And I actually wrote down questions and I said, can you ask me these? <laughs> ask me these, nice. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. You see, that, that, so, that's, that's brilliant because you don't have to be standing in front of a camera and, and ad-libbing. You know, you, you can yeah. literally to your to our point. How we create our our testimonials, we I sit down and, and interview the client, just talk to them, talk to them, easier, and then yeah. to what you just said though, it's that's where you're getting your true authenticity, because you can hear in someone's voice the tone of their voice, the speed in which they speak, whether or not someone is being for real or it's being rushed or it's a script or you're reading off a teleprompter. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. You could tell yeah, right just, now that that Joe Biden is is reading off a teleprompter. <laughs> Let's not go there, um, mate. What what else can you tell us about uh, LinkedIn before we wrap that topic up? What 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 else can I tell you about LinkedIn? Um, I think I think that the organic reach is not going to last forever. I think mm. that we've got a unique opportunity now. I think the other thing is like you're not going to be able to connect with people you don't know for free forever because this, yeah. they, they're going to monetize this this and um and the organic reach will decline. Their advertising will get better, um, which I'm excited about. I'm excited about the whole yep. advertising platform. But if you're trying to bootstrap a business or grow a business with no money, like the opportunity on linkedin right now is second to none yeah. i think it i think it's really is a time sensitive thing i mean i've been on this this train for 10 years yeah. it's not going to last forever you got to go ham on it right it's it's 
yeah. make hay while the sun shines. Um, yeah. So there will be other opportunities, but right now it's on yeah. LinkedIn. And if you if history tells you anything, there's more people moving over to LinkedIn. More people on LinkedIn means less opportunity for your stuff to be seen. So of course it's it's the writing is on the wall, you know. Yeah. So, similarly right. with TikTok right now, it's you could put videos up and you'll get thousands of views, and you're like, whoa, I only have you know a couple hundred followers. Um, but that's gonna die in the ass too when a lot more people come over. It's just well, it's just the law of the game. So there's a, there's a thing called a digital trust index. You probably come across it. And LinkedIn is like 70 and, and the closest one to it is Facebook and it's like 25 or something. Mm. So people trust the content on LinkedIn. Well, business decision makers are likely to trust the yeah. content three times more than other social platforms. So if you only get a thousand views on LinkedIn, you're getting 3000 on Facebook. I'd take the thousand views any day. If they're three mm. times more trusted. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. That's a nice addition. It's again, it's not about the ego metrics. It's the quality of it. Right, Absolutely, the quality of yeah, it. so important. Yeah, because you know, reach is is just visibility. It's just it's just you're getting someone's attention. It's like you could yeah. be interrupting them, but when you get engagement, it's like they actually care. Yeah, and that, and that's the metric you want to look at. Awesome, mate. I, I want to ask you a couple of random questions. This always okay, cool. gives me an insight into the person who, who I'm speaking yeah. with. <laughs> do Do you like wine? Yeah, I do. Yeah, red, red, red or white's your favourite. Red, red. Yeah. All right. Mm. Um, shout out to um, Jack Delosa. He, we just oh, yeah. put we just put a wine order in two nights ago. Got some beautiful Bordeaux's coming, and we we got a, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, um, the bank account doesn't like it, but it's a <laughs> it's an expensive hobby, right? Let's just put it that way. So you got a red wine, right? What's your favorite red wine? Um, favorite red wine. What's your go to? Look. Um, the um the i like the wines from the barossa valley the basket press the cool. heathcote basket press is really nice um mate i'm just a i think we're so lucky in australia yeah they're, the they're pretty, wine here pretty is awkward. amazing so let's just yeah. say you got a nice bottle of red wine right we don't need to get yeah. caught on what type and you're sitting yeah. down with with a you know a couple of your closest mates what what are you sitting down talking about what what's the current narrative that you're having right now Outside well, of all the, the you know, jibber jabber, but what what are you generally sitting down talking about? Well, you know, I moved back from Melbourne to Perth two years ago. I'm 35, so all my mates here got you know two children and a white picket fence, and I'm mm-hmm. single. So all they want to know is what you been up to, right? <laughs> you know, well, what what conversations? Um, if you could guide the conversation, <laughs> right? What what yeah. what stimulates you the most, like from a topical conversation perspective? No, I, I really like to go, um, I'm not really much of a surface level guy. I like to have mm. deep conversations. Um, uh, so, I mean, personal development is something that I'm really interested in. I'm always learning. I'm always reading. Um, and, you know, psychology and um, relationships are fascinating for me. And uh, I Why really like is psychology? Understand. Why is psychology fascinating? Why does it fascinate I just love, you? I just love people. Like, I, I you know... I'm a connector. I really enjoy people. And um, yeah, that's what it is. And I guess if you could influence people for the better, then, you know, that's a great way to make an impact on the world. Um, and I think, you know, a big part of that is storytelling. So I'm always thinking about stories is why I'm a good content creator, I think, <laughs> you know, um, mm-hmm. and uh, speaking is a bit, you know, a lot of storytelling, marketing is, is storytelling. Um, and so I think a lot about psychology. Mm. Who, who do you follow? Who do you who do you consume the most in, in those topics? Um, I've, the guy I've followed the longest would be Tony Robbins. I mean, I've been to twelve of twelve events of his. Mm. I volunteer as a mic runner when when there's no no viruses going around. <laughs> um, but Dr. John Demartini is another one. Yeah, um, jo- John Demartini. When I went to one of his events oh, many many years ago, I went to just an intro event, and it was yeah. only an hour presentation. And I was like, oh, there's something about this guy. And then I went to, I'd done his um, breakthrough. Yeah. Um, and I've literally never been, and this is how I've been able to best describe Dr. John Demartini. Like that is a guy who was a lifelong dedicated person to his craft, right? All he, all he wants to do is travel, learn, educate, and teach. That's, that's his yeah. thing, right? I, because I'd been to Tony Robbins and so forth prior and a number of others and, and I walked out of his event, Demartini's, like 
not motivated, but like literally internally cellular like inspired. Mm. I was like, because because of the depth, and this is where I uncovered that I like to I like to go deep too, right? So I like to have the conversation that's that's eight layers deeper than where it starts because that's mm. where for me and and the reason why I like that I feel is it's the unknown and I love I, I love exploring the unknown because mm. it's it's this I'm trying to solve this complex problem. Right, why the fuck are we on this planet? What are we even doing here? How does all this stuff work? And and everything like that sort of wraps itself into it. So I walked out of this event like literally feeling something I'd never felt before. And I had I haven't been able to feel that again until Jordan Peterson came on the scene for me. Oh, I love yeah, I just read his book, Twelve, 12 Rules of Life or whatever. Twelve it is. rules. Yeah, twelve rules. Yeah, his maps thing. for meaning book, right? And I know right now. There's a lot of people listening to this because I talk about, I think I've talked about Jordan Peterson on every podcast I've done, all right? Because wow. he, he's literally a, a mover for me in that aspect. But his book, Maps of Meaning, if you've ever listened to that or read that. So I got the audio book. It, yeah. It's like 35 hours. It's deep. It's like, it. I cannot listen to that book unless I'm in a dark room and I'm, there's no distractions, no nothing. I've got my AirPods in my ear and I just have to concentrate on every sentence. Because <laughs> it's it's that sort of challenge. It's that challenging to be able to consume and understand, right? Which again is it's almost like weight training for me when I'm in the gym. Like I love mm-hmm. training weights and I love physically pushing my muscles to its extension that it can go. Same thing with your mind. I think the only way we're going to grow our mind is to to push it to those levels where you're like, "Fuck, I feel like I know what they're talking about, but I don't really know what they're talking about right now." Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's he's amazing. I'm, I'm going to get that book, absolutely. Yeah, mate, g- give it a crack. Um, also, if you haven't watched his biblical studies on YouTube. Biblical studies? Yeah, so I, I'm not – well, let me ask you, what, what's your status <laughs> of religion? Are you? Would you call yourself religion, religious? Uh, um, so I guess I, I think they would categorize me as New Age. Okay. You know? Which I is what? What does that mean? Well, I think everything comes bound to perspective. I think you do create your own reality. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I do. I do believe in there's a purpose behind everything, but mm-hmm. I don't believe that we're supposed to know what it is. Otherwise, mm-hmm. we would. <laughs> yeah, fair call. So, um, without going down that rabbit, Warren, uh, maybe we have another chat one day over a bottle of wine. But his <laughs> his biblical studies and why I like this because it does relate a lot to to business and marketing and and life and psychology and all of that is. He breaks down, and I've never looked at religion like this because I'm not religious. I, I don't believe that there's a man up there who created this planet. I just personally don't believe in that, and I'm cool with that, right? But I believe there's something higher up there. I call it the universe that God, that yeah. shit happens, right? And there's reasons why it happens. Exactly. Now, yeah. he takes the, the Bible and literally breaks it down into the stories of what the Bible actually is. Because it's all stories, right? Stories yeah. create the world. Stories create the narrative. Stories create the outcomes. So if you take away that sort of religious aspect of it, of going, you know, there was Adam and Eve, and then they had their children, Cain and Abel, you know, that it's it's like take away the that there was an actual man who said, here you go, two people, you're going to start the world. But you look at it from a narrative perspective, it it really starts to challenge the way in which you look at, you know, psychology, people. How we've how we've cre- how we've been created and where the world's moving to right now within itself. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. So I, I've uh, enabled to hijack the episode itself. There, we, we were talking about LinkedIn, but we started to go into some good places. I want to before we wrap up, mate. What what else can you share with us? What do you think the world needs to know um, right now? And what words of wisdom, advice can you give us? Well, I think this applies to life as it does in business. I just it's something that's been on my mind a lot lately. And and um, Tony Robbins uh, is known for saying the secret to living is giving. Mm. And in my experience, you know, even in business, when my business hasn't been making the sales that I wanted to make, or I'm struggling with team members, it's generally because I'm focusing on myself and what I want. And as soon as I focus on my team, or my audience and I give without expectation, generally things seem to sort themselves out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was speaking to somebody yesterday who like went through an experience where they lost their sister, they were addicted to drugs, their business fell apart and, um, you know, it's clinically depressed and he ended up like going to an orphanage in Thailand 
and these kids have been like raped and um, abused and all they wanted to do is play basketball with them. And he thought, shit, you know, mm. if they can get through that, they've got every right to be complaining about life mm. and all they want to do is play basketball, then what the hell am I sitting here moping around for? You know, the, ch- the probability of us being born, like I think Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this, is something like 400,000 to one. It's like a trillion. So, yeah, yeah, well, well, yes. I mean, the fact that we're here is a miracle. Yeah. yeah. So, and so if we're not waking up every but, but day that's, that's hard. That, that's hard you know? for someone to reconcile, though, because it's like, yeah, I know it's a miracle, but I'm here. Right? Again, it's that perspective of realizing the, the power of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, most people are in effect. They like they think the external world controls how they feel. Oh, oh look, mm. I'm in lockdown. Of course, I feel depressed. No, like I should feel. I'm justified to feel depressed. I'm in lockdown. Yeah. You know, it, it's it is a choice. Yeah. You don't have to. You don't have to be depressed at all. Mm. Like you, you could write down a paper full page full of stuff of why this is serving you, and yep. you could choose to focus on that. It's up mm. to you. One leads to happiness. One leads to. So you've been miserable. Mm. What are you going to choose? Yeah, my, my, my acceptance strategy, as I call it, is everything's happening the way it's happening because it's happening and there's nothing that I can do about it. So embrace it and love it and, and take it for what it is, right? Because once you can reconcile that and you know that that's the, that's the only truth I know about anything on this planet. And it makes you <laughs> able to learn from your mistakes, right? Yeah. When you have that attitude. Because if you're a victim, you're not going to learn anything. Mm. It's, you know, you're just gonna, Everything's going to happen to you. Not yep. for you. Yeah, I love that one. That's a good one. All right, my man. This has been uh, this has been fun. We we need to yeah. definitely look at a, at a round two and, and talk about some uh, some of the important stuff. <laughs> yeah, thanks, no, buddy. Love to. Thanks for having me.